maximum we are live good evening and uh, welcome delegates for this uh, panel discussion on the occasion of international pathology day we have eminent pathologists here with us who will be sharing their knowledge expertise and experience with all of us a warm welcome to one to one and all uh, over to dr aditya for introduction of our panelists for the day hello uh, good evening all i am dr aditya agnihotri uh, secretary i uh, kciipm I'm here to, uh, first of all, greetings to all the members and delegates who are joining us live uh, for the, on the occasion of International Pathology Day. I'm here to welcome you all on behalf of our president, Dr. N.K. Alba, who couldn't be here uh, due to prior commitments. Uh, this International Pathology Day is being uh, celebrated uh, uh, on second November, second Wednesday of every uh, November uh, since 2014. And this was started by RCPATH and supported by associations across the country. Uh, the idea is to encourage uh, and highlight the vital role uh, that pathology plays in the diagnostic in the men, in the field of medicine and healthcare. And to uh, push forward the role, we have Dr. Social Media Subcommittee of Karnataka Chapter IAPM has uh, come out with this panel discussion with experts and eminent uh, pathologists from across uh, the state uh, who will be talking to us and sharing their experiences about the same. Uh, let me welcome uh, all the panelists, uh, beginning with uh, Dr. Jairam N. Iyengar, who, is, uh, who doesn't need any instruction. He, is a, he was a former president of Karnataka chapter IFM, and he's currently a managing director at Anand Diagnostic Laboratory and Newburgh Anand Reference Laboratory. Uh, although he's in corporate setup, he's a thorough academician, and he's never let his uh, the passion for uh, teaching uh, go, go away. And he's also a program coordinator for new CAP uh, proficiency testing program. Our second panelist is uh, Dr. Vani Ravi Kumar. Uh, she is uh, a lead consult, uh, lead pathologist at, uh, at RV Metropolis, uh, head of histopathology at RV Metropolis, Bengaluru. She has done a WHO fellowship in oncopathology, and she has over 25 years of laboratory experience. She is also a lead assessor for NABL, uh, New Delhi, and a technical assessor for histopath, cyto, uh, hemat, and clinical pathology. She is a regular. She conducts regularly work, regular workshops on liquid-based cytology, gynae pathology, and oncopathology. And her hobbies include uh, watercolor painting and yoga. Uh, welcome, Jairam sir and Vani Ravi Kumar, ma'am, to this panel discussion. We would love to hear from you. Our third panelist is uh, Dr. Vidya M N. Uh, she is a lead consultant, uh, histopathology and cytopathology at Astro Reference Laboratory, Bengaluru. She is also an executive committee member of KCIPM and member of IAC and Dermapath Society of India. She has done a basic training in molecular pathology uh, at, from CMC Vellore, and she's also a TAGO certified uh, pathologist for reporting of PDL1. She has uh, won the best paper award at uh, Capcom 2012, and she has more than 10 plus publications, and she has conducted multiple workshops, especially in IHC uh, for KCIPM and from Aster Labs also. Uh, she's a regular faculty at state and national level conferences. Our fourth panelist uh, is Dr. Uma Shankar, sir. Uh, he's done his uh, MD in pathology from the Government Medical College in Nagpur, and he is, has an academic experience spread over Kaylee Belkum and Enapoya Medical College in Mangalore. Currently, he's a professor and head of uh, Department of Pathology, Father Muller Medical College, Mangalore, and he's also the lab director there. He's delivered guest lectures at various state and national level uh, conferences and has 20 plus publications in journals. He is somebody who's used uh, uh, social media, especially Twitter, uh, extensively for teaching and academics. And he has a keen interest in music and photography. Our last panelist for the day will be uh, Dr. Mahesh Karigauda, who runs uh, one of the top notch diagnostic laboratories in the North Karnataka, that is Dr. Karigauda Diagnostic Laboratory in Vijapur. He's also a thorough academician and has formerly worked as a professor of pathology at Department of Pathology at uh, BLD University, uh, Vijapur. He's done his MD pathology from KMC Bangalore, and uh, he has 25 plus publications in national and international journal to his credit. I welcome all the panelists, uh, Dr. Jairam sir, Vani Tati Kumar ma'am, Uma Shankar sir, Vidya ma'am and Mahesh sir to this panel discussion and hope to have a very fruitful discussion and I'm sure the delegates will be happy to uh, listen to you all. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Arjuna ma'am. And before I, we begin with the discussion, let me introduce our moderator for the day. Uh, that's Dr. Arjuna Bhatt, who is a very active uh, social media subcommittee member of KCIPM. Uh, she has done, she's an associate professor at Father Muller Medical College, and she's also a renal pathologist, and she's done a PDCC in renal pathology. Over to you, Dr. Arjuna Bhatt, ma'am, for uh, the panel discussion. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Aditya, and welcome to all the panelists. Before we go into the panel discussion directly, we thought we'll just read out this poem, which is uh, written by one of the postgraduates, Dr. Bhavya, from St. John's Medical College on the account of International Pathology Day. She's uh, titled this poem as Roga Shastra. Sukshma Darshakave Beku, Ninnana Nodoke, Adara Sahaya Dindale, Karnuve Dodda Gatrake. Nina Bagge Tilialu, Kadiru Varu Vaidiru, Ni Yenendu Varni Salu, Roga Shastra Nyeru Iruvaru. Such a beautiful poem. Uh, congratulations and th thank you, Dr. Bhavya, for this beautiful lines. So, with that, we'll begin with the panel discussion. Uh, the first question uh, to Dr. Jairam, sir. Sir, can you recall of some instance when clinician has profusely thanked you? Oh, that's a wonderful thought, uh, Dr. Archana. Uh, but I would rather uh, recall certain situations where uh, people have really got back to my team as such, because I'm really proud to have a wonderful team working alongside with me. And uh, I would, with your permission, take two instances, which sure, sir, sure, sir. Uh, uh, the way in which we as diagnosticians have shaped the treatment or diagnosis of a certain uh, people who uh, have had uh, the requirement. The first one where uh, we've had a physician, and in fact, multiple physicians getting back to us was uh, when we, we have an in-house uh, uh, physician, Dr. Ajit, who has a very keen eye. His job is to basically look at all the executive. When I talk of pathology, it's not necessarily histopathy. It could be chemical path also. So he would review the reports and then talk to the patients about what is abnormal with the report. So in the, in the profiles which we have created, we have ensured that uh, there are certain vital things which we include in, say, executive health checkup. So total calcium, ionic calcium being part of the profile, uh, his uh, observations there, looking at the variations in these, and even patients with relatively non-specific symptoms, fatigue and things like that, he's been able to kind of point it towards the abnormal parathyroid function. And we picked up at least six to eight cases of uh, either a parathyroid adenoma or a parathyroid hyperplasia. And in fact, uh, a lot of endocrinologists have gotten back to Ajit saying that uh, uh, we thank you for having identified this because the patient is now cured. So that is one situation where we've had physicians coming back and thanking us for giving them a lead in diagnostics to pick up a relatively you know, un, uh, invisible malady in that patient. And the other uh, was, again, it's again representative of the entire uh, team that we have uh, almost uh, February 2020, before the pandemic, one of our colleagues in hematology came across uh, an abnormal uh, scatter on the, on the peripheral smear from a 12-year-old child who had fever, nothing else. And he saw that this is an APML. Immediately, he contacted the father because we didn't have the number of the clinicians. He contacted the father and said this child needs immediate attention. And the family was kind of first in denial and then they were confused. They said, How the Nale Hoktivi, I'll we'll go tomorrow and show the physician. But this boy, this colleague of mine, he said, Nothing, you have to go right now. Give me your address, I'm coming to your house. He went all the way, met them, convinced the father, and but the father said, I don't have money for treatment. Immediately. Uh, my colleague contacted Baptist Hospital, contacted the hemato-oncologist there and managed to get treatment for this child at a concessional rate. So this is where it's very important for us to go beyond the confines of what we feel is our responsibility. And even today, to more than uh, close to three years from the time this child was diagnosed and treated, the father repeatedly comes and gives an update saying, my boy is well. So this is very gratifying. That shows how much the parent 
is indebted to the commitment which is shown by one of our uh, colleagues. So these were two examples which are representative of the entire situation. That was uh, very interesting, sir. Um, Vani, ma'am, uh, do you recall of any uh, instances where your clinicians have thanked you? Yes, thank you, Archana. Yes, there are uh, several occasions. I'm uh, at a loss to pick up uh, which particular occasion because, you know, as pathologists, uh, we have uh, helped the clinicians several times. Sometimes, you know, uh, it is just providing a rapid uh, report, like they do a small biopsy, say an endometrial curettage or a cervical biopsy or endoscopic biopsy. A rapid report when we give, it will help them to plan the next uh, major surgery uh, very fast. And uh, at that time, they profusely thank us for the rapid service we have been giving them, especially in the small biopsies. And very urgent uh, reporting the peripheral smears, urgent reports of platelets counts where they're abnormal. And uh, we help the clinician to manage the uh, critical cases. Yes, definitely the clinicians have profusely thanked us. Unexpected malignancies like we pick up CML, CLLs in asymptomatic uh, patients. And when we inform the clinician, they profusely thank us for um, picking up these and also for informing them. Or in a fever, they would not have asked for an MP. But when we are looking at the smear and we pick up malaria and we inform them that it is malaria positive, again, we get a lot of gratitude from them. Two instances even I would like to quote where uh, really our uh, 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 reports, you know, they've helped the patient. One is uh, a child, I mean, a, a male patient, he's a, about a 20 plus year old. He has mild anemia and he's been going to so many doctors, uh, not with any symptoms, but for routine checkup or something. They always are detecting, oh, you have anemia, your hemoglobin is just 11, for a male it is less. And they are ordering all the ion studies, B12, and nobody had even picked up, you know, any abnormality and pumping him with ion on and off. But when he came to our lab and we did a CDC and it's a routine for us, you know, whenever we find a mild anemia, even a mild reduction in hemoglobin, we immediately do the Menzer index with the RBC count and the MCV. And we see whether it is below 13 or above 13, whether it is iron deficiency or could it be a beta thalassemia trait. And in this person, we advised the electrophoresis and we called the patient and we asked him to get it done. And it was a beta thal trait. And they are so grateful. How many years we have been going to physicians? Nobody has picked up, you know, and they're just pumping with iron. They're just telling you have some mild anemia like that. And we are very grateful that you have picked up. And they also got the entire family also screened for uh, uh, any uh, thalassemia trait. So that was one instance. The other instance also was quite interesting. It was a case of mediastinal lymphadenopathy and the pulmonologists were investigating why the mediastinal lymph nodes were enlarged. They were doing bronchoscopy. They did a TBNA. They did aspirate. It was cell poor. They struggled a lot to establish the diagnosis and they couldn't. And the slides were sent to us for second opinion. We saw it was quite cell poor. And uh, we just wanted to know why. You know, so we called the patient to have a look at the patient. It is very important as pathologists, you know, we are also clinicians. We have every right to call the patient to examine before we give out our opinion. It is not that just seeing a slide, we need to tell what it is. We call the patient and we just wanted to examine what is, why that has come as second opinion. We didn't have sufficient clinical details also. We found a big axillary lymph node and we put a needle there and FNAC proved it to be a tuberculosis. What they were struggling with all this mediastinal mass and doing, it was actually a case of tuberculosis, which we could pick up with an easy FNA of the axillary lymph node. Here, the clinicians themselves, they uh, really thanked us a lot for uh, picking up this diagnosis. And uh, these are certain instances that I would like to share. Thank you, ma'am, for those interesting uh, scenarios. And uh, indeed, uh, ma'am has brought in a very valid point that we are not only pathologists, but we are pathologists and clinicians as well. Um, Mahisa, would you like to share any instances where clinicians have thanked you? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks, Arshna, Madam, and Aditya for inviting me in this panel discussion. Uh, I'd like to quote one uh, uh, case recently, a few months back, we had. Uh, it was a small child around eight years old and he was from a small place taluka place and they 
they do have a pediatric hospital and he he was admitted with a, a fever weakness and uh, bouts of diarrhea and with a routine investigation there they, they started treating as a viral fever with uh, dysentery something like that and uh, on second or third day the patient condition deteriorated with the falling hp and they transfused to one point of blood and uh, he didn't improve then they shifted to other pediatric hospital again the same condition they brought to a super specialty hospital in my place that is the bijapur again it's a small city but nowadays we are getting a good uh, specialty super specialist also yeah and the basic investigations they sent to our center and uh, we could see uh, a, a low platelets were there and we on the smear it was showing a normocytic normochromic anemia and many cystocytes were there and uh, we called the patient the history and everything and we just did one urine creatinine also it was raised and we reported as a normocytic normochromic anemia with hemolytic uh, picture suggestive of uh, hemolytic uremic syndrome and seeing the report nephrologist immediately called us about this confirmation of all the findings so on the same day he put the patient on uh, this uh, plasma pheresis they have got a dialysis with uh, additional facility of plasma pheresis and uh, next two days the patient became very much improved uh, his hb percentage increased uh, clinical symptoms improved and he called us back again that uh, he thanked us and showed his gratitude for your valuable laboratory services uh, this uh, again whenever we talk about uh, somebody said thank you i remember this case uh, we got few more cases but because of time limit i just stick here that is indeed very interesting sir timely diagnosis uh, which has uh, influenced which has the management the uh, and saved the life indeed uh, vidya ma'am would you like to share uh, some instances with us Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arshna and Dr. Aditya, and good evening to all the delegates and my teachers who are there here or as panelists. So, like uh, the other uh, doctors have already mentioned, uh, turnaround time is something that the clinicians do appreciate. At least in our scenario, we see that most of the clinicians are very polite people. Uh, it is very unusual that we have somebody who is rude to the pathologist because we, like how Dr. Vani has mentioned, we are definitely. are the part of the clinical setup so we cannot run away from that fact and we are there to support the complete hospital or the clinical care system so i would want to quote a couple of instances uh, especially in my laboratory where my team is entirely made up of women so there is total women empowerment out here and uh, we report a lot of transplant biopsies and this can be done sometimes we are called uh, during the night wherein our pathologists step in to those roles and attend to it and we definitely had one instance of a complete team work and we attend to a lot of cases from outside of bangalore especially for one transplant biopsy where our logistics team our accession team including our pathology team all put in a lot of tremendous work and we could report an outstation sample within less than 24 hours and this was a renal biopsy reporting that was done by one of my colleagues so the clinician was very uh, happy about it and uh, the patient could be treated uh, on time and also in case of unexpected malignancies that is where we see that uh, the clinicians appreciate the most when we give them a diagnosis of uh, something which is completely out of your uh, clinical diagnosis so that is when they really appreciate the fact that you have picked up the phone talked to them and conveyed the message so it is no more that we are just going to see a routine peripheral smear or a histopath slide or a biochemistry report our analysis is there definitely on the report and that is what we need to convey and talk to them so one on one communication definitely helps and that is when they appreciate in fact i had one of my uh, clinical colleagues who had uh, sent a uh, lady um, uh, gif icon with a multitasking so because there are all ladies in the lab right now and they take care of their families come to work deliver reports on time so that is what we are looking at and at the end of the day it's definitely a team effort and that comes into picture thank you very well said ma'am team work and uh, polite clinicians do help in increasing our efficiency and uh, building our confidence uma shankar sir would you like to share any instances Yeah, sure, Arjuna. Uh, first yes, of all, I would like to thank uh, the KCIM uh, social media network for inviting me for this panel discussion. Of course, uh, as uh, Vani Madam and Jaram sir told, all of the panelists told, we have a lot of instances, such instances that uh, standard by the clinicians. But if you remember your old days, when your your formative days or your younger days, uh, some points you definitely relish it. 
I would like to mention one mishap that happened to me in, uh, when I was in Belgaum. I was just post MD four years old, and the Belgaum was a new place for me, altogether new place for me. And this was a case of Xanthu uh, Grandma School Fees Titles, uh, referred by I re really honor him, uh, Dr. Sergeant Dr. Ashok Gothi. He was the uh, former uh, HOD and Dean of uh, JNMC. It was a case of Xanthu Grandma School Fees Titles. I gave a diagnosis of it was a straight case. And all of us know that it is a clinical mimicker uh, and even surgical mimicker as for the Kasimul Kala battery. And once I gave the diagnosis, Dr. Bodhi called me and uh, he wanted to discuss the case with me. I gave a dis new discussion. Later on, this case was taken in a uh, CPC meeting and uh, I was supposed to uh, present the pathological aspect of it. I still remember that day and Dr. Bodhi uh, really congratulated me for making a diagnosis because that case made a lot of difference in the clinical management. And uh, that moment, I always relish. Although there are several instances, but that was the thing uh, uh, made me to uh, you know uh, have a contact with the clinical, uh, clinical colleagues and uh, how we uh, communication with the clinical colleagues makes a lot of difference. Yeah. Thank you, sir, for that uh, instance. Uh, uh, dealing with uh, some cases uh, makes a Sherlock Holmes at times. Uh, when we get the right diagnosis, it is a moment of triumph for all of us. Some cases make us uh, better than our existing potential by challenging us. Uh, can you tell us about your uh, triumph moments, uh, Jairam, sir? Thank you. Thank you, Archana. Uh, for me, a, a triumph moment is not the moment where I want to prove that I, I am better than you. I know much more than what you have. I have made the right diagnosis. You have made the wrong one because each one is on a on their own journey, and the each one struggles. Their their mind is always working full steam to try to analyze what could be going wrong in that small bit of tissue. So I I'm not really enamored by what diagnosis we have made on say uh, slides that have come to us for an opinion because these like uh, the KBC have gone through multiple lifelines. So you know. A lot of things have been eliminated and there's a very little uh, thing for you to choose between. So very often you may be right. Uh, the actual wow moment for me was when I made a very difficult diagnosis on a limited material in a young lady who, in fact, after the diagnosis was made also, people just called back and said, are you sure, are you sure? This was a young lady around 22 or so, a frail looking lady, I recollect, this was years ago, who came with a small nodule in the upper pole of the left lobe of thyroid. It's less than a centimeter. And then we were not doing ultrasound guided FNSS, palpated the thing while she was deglutating and then put the needle, got in a few drops of uh, you know, material made some couple of smears and it was not very cellular, but then there are definite cell clusters towards the edge of the smear. And these cells were large. They were kind of plasma cytoid, had abundant cytoplasm and the GIMSA stain showed reddish granules. I mean, that was something which really struck my mind that even though this material is small, it could be a medullary carcinoma. Then probing back to the, the young lady's complaints, I also realized that she has some GI symptoms, a bowel hurry is there and various other symptoms are there. So I said that this looks to me like a medullary carcinoma. The physicians were not convinced. The surgeons were not convinced. But after a lot of discussion, they decided, okay, uh, she has systemic manifestations, which probably could be you know, attributed to some multiple endo endocrine problem and so on. So they decided they would go and explore and give me the tissue. And that turned out to be a medullary carcinoma. And the patient's entire symptoms disappeared after that. So that kind of a situation where it is challenging and you have to have that conviction to communicate that my feel is that this is the diagnosis. And when that turns out, you're always scared, you know, you may be wrong. So when that happens, that is the, that's the wow moment for a, for a pathologist, no matter how junior or how senior they are. 
that's so interesting, sir, and uh, such beautiful thoughts. Uh, Vani, ma'am, uh, would you like to tell us about wow moment or a moment of triumph? Yeah, actually, uh, I would like to share one uh, case. The patient uh, was a doctor herself. I think she was an ENT doctor or something, and her sister was a gynecologist. And uh, this doctor was uh, entangled in a legal uh, issue. Okay, it was uh, like a divorce, so she was involved in the legal matter. And her LBC Pap smear came to us for uh, cytology, and it was showing HSIL. So we saw once, twice, uh, uh, primary screening, secondary screening, it was clear cut HSIL and we gave the report of HSIL, high grade lesion and advised a biopsy. The uh, gynecologist, she just uh, told the cervix looks very normal. Uh, I will take a biopsy and send and she took a direct biopsy without doing corposcopic biopsy, guided biopsy, the direct. The direct biopsy came, it looked perfectly normal, but we are very sure the cytology is high grade. Biopsy is normal. Then we said, okay, we will do HPV DNA on the LBC sample. HPV DNA was added on and it came negative. So this is the scenario, uh, high, high risk HPV negative, uh, cytology showing HSIL and the cervical biopsy showing normal and the legal battle is going on. And then finally I said, please, you, we should repeat somewhere something, it is not matching. So we, she said, okay, I will do a colposcopy and do the biopsy. This time I warned them, when you do a colposcopic biopsy, please look deep into the endocervical crypts as well and take a biopsy from there. Because sometimes now we are finding the carcinoma arising from the crypts and normally they are not giving that much importance to that. So this time colposcopy was done and a deep uh, biopsy from the endocervical crypt and it showed a very beautiful CIN grade three. Now we have, okay, correlation, cytohistocorrelation was done and it is matching, but HPV was negative. She we repeated HPV again negative. And she said, no, no, because this is a legal case, we need to demonstrate the HPV. And finally, I thought we will do a P16 ink 4A IHC marker. And that is a surrogate marker for HPV DNA because this P16 ink 4A is a protein which is involved in the cell cycle regulation and it will be apparently overexpressed in high risk HPV. So we did a P16 in 4A and it was positive and hence it, the whole picture was completed and uh, we, we could uh, kind of, you know, complete the whole scenario. So that is uh, one case where I felt, you know, like a Sherlock Holmes going one by one by one and trying to put everything, the picture to match it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing that uh, incidence. Uh, Mahisa, would you like to tell us something about your tramp moment? Uh, yes, I remember one case. It's a COVID time, right? Last year, we had a lot of cases. Uh, we do diagnose most of many of the thyroiditis following the COVID. And uh, endocrinologists were quite surprised to see so many suddenly cases. And when we took a history, they were giving a history prior to that four to six weeks COVID positivity, right? And uh, one more case we had is a 55 years old female. She was admitted with no any support to treatment, only medical line of treatment and few patches of a CT scan. Medical line of treatment within four or five days, she got discharged and she was recovered completely. And after four to five weeks, she developed a weakness and the slight breathlessness is there. Again, she came back to the hospital and she, she was showing a sort of feverish and on examination, mild splenomegaly was there, HP and the CBC parameters was pancetopenia. And uh, they did a repeat CT, but no, no active lesions as such. They only the healed patches were there. And the uh, clinicians were a little bit worried which is due to a recurrence of a COVID or something else. And then uh, peripheral smear was showing normocytic normochromic anemia and uh, just no, no atypical cells or something like that. And because of low count, uh, we thought like I advise a bone marrow. Then we did a bone marrow aspiration study and uh, it was showing a uh, normal cellular features and we could see a lot of uh, hemophagocytosis there. Then uh, everything was fitting in then. Then we had to prove that whether it's a HLH or something else, then we ordered the further test like serum ferritin, LDH, serum triglycerides, it was all was showing very high and the fibrinogen levels were very low. And putting this all this together, we put it in a uh, condition that is uh, hemophag hemophagocytic uh, lymphohistocytic syndrome. 
and we conveyed the message to a treating physician and he got convinced that deteriorating conditions over the period of last four or five days post covid post viral infection he he started aggressive treatment with immunosuppression steroids in fact the patient improved for next eight to 10 days and beyond that you know that hls syndrome is very poor outcome she went into a multi-organ failure and uh, we we always help the clinician about this uh, rare findings in a routine exposure and we should keep about mind about whenever we get a new findings we should correlate clinical out presentations and convey this to the clinician uh, this is one of the uh, quite rare cases we come across with uh, in clinical setups and that's to during the covid time we should always keep about uh, these things can happen post covid we don't know exactly still the effects are there post viral so many things we are getting autoimmune diseases all those things we should keep in mind thank you thank you sir for uh, telling us about these uh, post covid findings and uh, diagnosing rare, rare cases presentation. Uh, uh, putting all the uh, investigations and the reports together and coming out with rare uh, investigation, uh, rare diagnosis. Uh, Vidya, ma'am, uh, would you like to tell us about your Sherlock Holmes and Triumph moment? Yes, uh, we are all uh, diagnosticians, so I think we're all Sherlock Holmes without a cigar. That's what I would want to say. With every sample, uh, there is something new to be diagnosed, new to be told to the patient or to the clinician. So it is not that we know what is there behind a blood sample or within a vacutainer or within a tissue sample. So with every sample, there is a diagnosis uh, made by us. So we are Sherlock Holmes with each and every sample that comes uh, into the lab. So this is what I would want to say, but there have been some wow moments, definitely. And uh, especially this is what I picked up from Jaram sir also. He's a, a very good histomorphologist. So uh, nowadays everything goes into IHC and molecular, but he's one person who always insists see the morphology and then put up the IHC. So this is where for a, at least a surgical pathologist or an academic pathologist, the wow moment is when your histomorphology and your IHC go together hand in hand. That is when you're very happy. Yes, I made the right diagnosis on HND and the same thing has been added on with the IHC. So that is how you go about making your diagnosis. So we had a case where um, and this was basically an elderly male patient who presented to the hemato oncologist and uh, the protein electrophoresis everything was done as a suspect myeloma patient along with a uh, few bone marrow findings also which was a uh, query reactive uh, plasmacytosis or could be neoplastic but a definite opinion could not uh, be given and this patient had also got some uh, multiple lymph nodes so he had lymphadenopathy and they finally decided to go ahead and do the uh, lymph node biopsy what we received was these days the fashion is that you get a lot of core biopsy so it is no more the practice that you're going to get excision uh, that is an unfortunate part especially for lymph node diagnosis and we received a core biopsy where we had to make a diagnosis uh give something worthwhile to the clinician or indicate what exactly would be the diagnosis so this is when we uh, all uh, put in our thinking caps and uh, we uh, gave a diagnosis and told the clinician that we need some add-on biochemical parameters few other serological uh, evaluations which need to be done and in fact it was um a multidisciplinary or team effort that happened for this case diagnosis and we in fact ordered the serum igg4 levels and along with that interleukins and all that this also was uh, one case which we saw in the post covid uh, like how dr mahesh mentioned and uh, finally we had uh, we came out with a diagnosis of IgG4 related disease. This is what we had suspected on the lymph node biopsy, which was then uh, collaborated with the serological findings. And in fact, uh, this patient uh, was then referred from the hemato oncologist to the immunologist. And the patient is uh, doing very well. Now the lymph nodes have disappeared completely. All his uh, serological parameters are back to normal. So these are certain wow moments. Yes, uh, the patient is getting well with your diagnosis. That is a wow factor. Thank you. That was very interesting, ma'am. Uma Shankar, sir. Yeah, Archana, there are several wow moments. But uh, if I remember one case, it was not a wow moment, it was a goosebumps for me. It happened recently. Uh, it was a breast core biopsy. Uh, you know, most of the times we get very sketchy uh, uh, history in that. So core biopsy I was looking into and uh, there was a tumor tissue. As along with tumor tissue, I saw some skeletal muscle fibers. Of course, we all keep seeing them. But there was some bone tissue and cartilage tissue also. Then the resident who was sitting next to me, I just asked, what it could be? 
then we thought in lines of metaplastic carcinoma. But many times you have to use a common sense. So when I kept searching for the slide, I saw lung tissue also. Then it was not a wow moment, it was a little serious issue. Then I picked up a phone and called the surgeon. Uh, was the biopsy was the guided or unguided? He told it was unguided biopsy. Then I told uh, probably must have punctured the lung also. Then he said no, he didn't puncture the lung. Then I asked uh, why do why didn't you call the patient and can't just confirm it? He was a little reluctant, but I insisted you better call the patient and uh, just ask it because uh, the patient has pneumothorax. Then it is a serious issue. Then he call, probably called the patient. The patient had chest pain after the procedure and she had a bout of hematopsia also. But she was lucky enough that she didn't have uh, pneumothorax. And later on, of course, he called me back and uh, congratulated. And I think many times we need to your, uh, use your common sense than textbook knowledge. And that was the thing which I, you know, made our uh, entire situation uh, different. Because well, probably could have called it as metaplastic carcinoma, but it was actually a carcinoma of the regular carcinoma with a uh, external tissue. I think my Twitter account shows this uh, major also. That was a scary uh, moment, I can say, sir. <laughs> I think you know about the case. Okay, we discussed it. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Uh, Jairam, sir, next question, sir. Uh, 1 plus 1 is not always equal to 2 in pathology. Uh, at times it is 3, 4, we do not know what. So, how do you deal with the gray zones in your practice? These are major nightmares that um, all of us dread. We would pray at the end of the day that uh, we come back home with 1 plus 1 equal to 2. But uh, that's never the case. Uh, before I say what and how you should deal with it, I would share a story. Not a story, it's an incident. If we've gone through this uh, from 2009 till 2022, we faced this. This case has tormented us. In 2009, a lady, uh, middle-aged to you know, young elderly, I should say, uh, had come with a breast lump and uh, some fluid was aspirated by our colleagues. And uh, they did see some enlarged cells, but attributed it to reactive ATP. There was a lot of necrosis with inflammation foam cells and they did they just called it as a cystic disease of breast no evidence no evidence of malignancy i mean that was in 2009 and uh, 2011 apparently the lady uh, had uh, enlargement of the swelling and then was worked up and then it was diagnosed as having a carcinoma so they got back with the legal notice saying that we missed carcinoma in 2009 and the if it was picked up then she could have been given early treatment and all that so the case went on to cut a, a long story short it went back and forth state forum national forum finally the case was discharged in june 2022 we learned a lot of lessons uh, from this we cannot go away from the fact that all of us do face gray areas and uh, especially gray zone lesions of the breast itself, people can give multiple lectures. Now, unfortunately, few of our colleagues in the, in the fraternity on the clinical side do not accept that we are plagued with these gray zone areas. And obviously the lay public for them, if something is put in, a needle is put in, whether it's FNA or whatever, limited procedures are there you know that limitations of this and then especially lesions like cystic disease of breast the variables become much much more so a lot of things have to be dealt with so what becomes very very important for us is to communicate the description what you give in your report especially for a gray zone should not limit itself to one line or two lines you need to go cell by cell. You need to analyze and say why you are calling this thing as a reactive ATPA or a react degenerative changes and so on. So that becomes a very important thing that you communicate that you're dealing with the difficult case. That takes care of part of the problem. Second is, of course, you need to add on certain disclaimers. Disclaimers should not be saying that 
this is uh, my report. You cannot hold this report against me in the court of law. I mean, we are here for that. We need to stand by our report, but then you need to justify what your report signifies, what are the limitations of whatever procedure you are you have done, and what is the advice you need to give. At that time, we had not had the practice of bringing in comments about triaging and all that. But once this came up, I mean, we thought we have not done the right thing so far. It's the right time, at least now, to bring in uh, comments. So sometimes you have your comments which are longer than your body of your report. But then that, in given cases, I think saves your day. So bring in all these explanatory notes, bring in the disclaimers, bring in comments, bring in the valid advice or whatever advisory services you need to give. And equally important is pick up the phone and reach out to the clinician and say, this is a difficult case. Please take care of whatever you are doing, going to do. Lean heavily on your other you know, judgment, clinical judgment and so on. So these are things which become part and parcel of our responsibility to safeguard ourselves to safeguard our organization and so on. And of course, to help the patient get a proper diagnosis at that time. And the other important thing is if you are not sure of something, if you do not know a particular system or a biopsy system, suppose I get a brain biopsy and I say, I've not seen too many brain biopsies, but I want to read the book and maybe I would say it's a glioma. But beyond that, I think you need to very clearly communicate that this is not my primary area of expertise. And then you could even take the initiative, refer the slide to a neuropathologist or advise saying that an opinion from a neuropathologist is would, would, would help the patient more. I think these are certain situations which we need to be aware of and put it into practice so that there is very clear communication that I'm strong in this, this lesion is clear cut, it is unequivocal, but when it comes to the cat on the wall situations, you have to say the cat is on the wall, it could jump this side or that side, so please watch where it is going to jump. So that is the message I'd like to communicate to you all. Thank you, sir. A lot of learning points um, uh, about description, disclaimers, advisory services and uh, following up and speaking with the clinician. Uh, so many uh, important uh, points you have told us, sir. Uh, Uma Shankar, sir, uh, this question is for you, sir. Uh, do you feel our uh, work is not recognized? Uh, earlier days with me could be yes, but in the present scenario, my answer is no. Uh, presently, the, because of awareness and the social media thing, uh, patients, the clinicians, and even administrators uh, know the importance of uh, lab medicine, not only pathology, uh, in all areas of lab medicine, they know it. And uh, I feel, and even clinicians also uh, try to communicate more. Uh, I think now the question what you asked is, yeah, our work has been uh, fairly recognized in this uh, time, what I feel is. Rightly said, sir, times are changing. So uh, now our work is being recognized. That is what sir says. Uh, next question for Mahesh, sir. Sir, uh, how important is our role in healthcare team? Uh, uh, first of all, when you posted this question to me, I was a little bit uh, understanding what is this healthcare team. Okay, then uh, healthcare team is involved in the treating the patient, then preventing the illness, and also it is involved in the educa education also, education to the larger public or students, whatever is there. As a pathologist, we are all like medical specialists, right? Uh, we are undergone into a basic medical training like in MBBS, then a specialist in MD pathology or DND course training. And many of us are working as a consultant pathologist as uh, one establishment or a hospital-based laboratory or a corporate lab or hospitals. And uh, uh, few, uh, in fact, many of them are also working in medical colleges as a faculty, yeah, as a teacher or a research uh, fellowship. 
and few of us like they are into research field also and we are involved in various sections in pathology right from clinical pathology hematology then cytology histopathology immunohistochemistry, chemistry and few are now last few years the many of the pathologists have chosen the rarer uh, subjects like uh, uh, genetic lab immunopathology then molecular pathology also and a few of us are also working as a blood bank medical officer. Then whenever, wherever which field we work, we as a pathologist take the responsibility of our reports, right? And we take care that our reports reaches to the right person in the right clinician, which helps the treating, uh, treating the patients in a, a well-established protocol in this particular disease entities. And uh, pathologists are having a bigger roles in accreditation of the lab let, let it be our own lab or the corporate labs and i would like to put uh, convey the important message that this accreditation in in a laboratory setup there's no other medical specialty which has promoted and implement a, a quality assurance in a sophisticated standard manners we got a documentation that this is the one which we require and this is the accreditation whereas other specialties it is all based on the uh, documentation itself there is no values at all in that right and as a role of pathologist, uh, we we act in a team activity rather than a single person. Uh, we got a team activity. We are managing our lab staff, which are our uh, managers or a lab technicians. And in the in the other side, we we have to manage our clinicians also. Means in terms of conveying the new test or a new uh, protocols. What is the outcome of a new test? The sensitivity. All those things we have to convey. And rarely we come across with the administration also uh, in, a, in a society role or a community level. We have to interact with our uh, health uh, officials in the department, government department or uh, private uh, NGOs uh, to go into a uh, certain uh, uh, test which are required at the community levels, which can prevent it, right? We have got a very good programs about the malarial program also. We used to intimate about every positive cases on daily basis. Right. With that, I think in at least in interior part of Karnataka, non-coastal areas, it has drastically reduced from eight to ten cases per day. We hardly see two, three cases in a year now. Uh, I, I think even in coastal areas, it has come down drastically. I suppose. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. it's come down. Post-COVID, yes. very few cases actually. Okay. Right. And uh, to put into all this uh, uh, that role was pathologist in a healthcare team. I would like to put into six or uh, six or seven points. Uh, we are the experts, right? We are the expert in certain aspects that we are the clinical interpretations. We are expert in the diagnostic test. We convey the message to the clinicians and we are very expert in understanding our own test and methodology, right? No other person can understand that what is the principle of this particular test. And we, we, are, we are expert in advising certain tests which will clinch the diagnosis, right? And uh, the clinical diagnosis means I want to convey that we have we, we, we are very much sure about the right test at the right time for the right patient, right? And uh, we are involved in quality methodology also. We are, we are the expert, like no other person can be more expert than the pathology because we have been trained as a medical uh, undergraduate and in pathology, we learn about so many disease processes, right? And second point is that we also have a, we are also a good communicator, right? And uh, we communicate with the, treating doctors which uh, we we are a bit, we, we are in a position to understand their requirement also the new test processes or why we're not starting here why there is a delay in tat report we are very able to communicate very quickly and understand their requirement also and uh, uh, we communicate with our own subordinates the technicians about the qc management everything and as the administrators we are also a good communicator to the health official whatever they they convey the message we are able to understand it properly and put it in a practice in a day-to-day -day basis and as a, uh, a communicator of the patient sometimes we have to be like pathologist as a physician where we have to take extract as much as information directly from the patient itself and third one is we also act like a collaborator collaborator in the sense that we effectively communicate with the other staff within the department or within the hospitals uh, uh, within and interdepartmental issues uh, about the newer test uh, induction and the training programs that which is required for the uh, addition into the test menu and of course we are very good collaborate for the educational purpose and the quality activities also and we also 
has got a managerial um, managerial uh, experiences where we supervise and manage the lab professionally and uh, use uh, uh, resources which we educate ourselves and train our subordinates and health uh, informer right we also act like a health advocate or a informer uh, basically with the advent of covid 19 uh, so many things new things we have learned it uh, one example is that we used to learn when the COVID emerged in our country, we used to learn about that simple NL ratio, right? We, we started implementing in our report, what is this NL ratio? And clinicians are also aware of this NL ratios. So they utilize it properly. So we, we sometimes we inform the, uh, the new methods or a new test is just shift in one parameters. It has changed so many things to understand the uh, severity of the COVID. And of course, uh, to the uh, uh, we always follow that uh, emerging new diseases, informing to the health officials, to the government officials. We are very prompt in this, all those things. Very well, then, uh, as a teacher. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, sir. Last, last two, one minute, okay. Uh, as a teachers and the research scholars, many of us like we work, uh, we were working and uh, in the medical colleges, we we undertake the teaching profession. We and we teach our undergraduate, postgraduate very effectively. I, I don't want to go into depth about these things. And lastly, we, we always behave professionally, right? Uh, whatever we do, we deliver the highest quality services with uh, integrity and honesty. And uh, we practice pathology uh, very uh, ethically in obligations with our present uh, laws, whatever state and national laws. And in a nutshell, I would like to we got an important role in various aspects of healthcare team. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Very well brought out uh, all the different roles uh, that we pathologists uh, have in healthcare team. Uh, Vidya, ma'am, uh, can clinical medicine exist without pathology, ma'am? What are your views on this? I don't think so. so uh, I think we are like how your topic mentions. We are the backbone, or we form the spine of uh, of the healthcare system. I think both pathology and radiology today play a huge role, and uh, definitely COVID has taught us a lot of things. So the this is where the lab diagnostic. Uh, it may have been microbiology, but definitely the all the uh, departments were activated during uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. So without uh, pathology, I don't think um, it is uh, possible for uh, for the healthcare system to work efficiently. And uh, we are looking at an age where everything is evidence based. So I don't think any clinician goes and palpates or touches the patient anymore. It is order a set, whole set of blood investigations or directly do a biopsy or do radiology, x-ray, PET. So for everything there is PET now. So it is similar to for everything there is Google. We have PET in the hospital. So that is how things have changed now. The scenario has changed. But definitely it will come back to the pathologist what you are going to diagnose there. And they wait for your diagnosis completely uh, to administer the treatment. So you are a clinical uh, specialist out there who is behind the scenes, uh, bringing out the correct diagnosis. In fact, for us, uh, most of the clinicians wait for our uh, reports. Uh, our reports, especially the radiologists and the pathologists, are the only two people in the hospital who are going to sign uh, on the reports, right? So your signatures are there and they're very well uh, held in the, um, I mean, it's a legal document. So, but whereas uh, it is not so for the other clinicians, so they wait for your reports definitely. And uh, also all the more for the pathologists because you're trying to bring out the diagnosis to them. And uh, in our scenario, until we sign and release the report, they do not go ahead with the treatment because they need to counsel the patient's attendants and the patient also before administering any treatment. These days, if you look at it, uh, the patients are also quite alert. There are a lot of doctors for them in the market. Uh, they can go for another opinion. They um, uh, uh, research everything on Google. Though it is half baked knowledge, they're going to ask you multiple questions. So then that is when the clinician comes back to you and says that we need a confirmatory report from your end. You simply can't sign up a report telling it could be this or this. So we need to come to a very close diagnosis so that it is going to help them in their uh, treatment. Otherwise, they are going to be bombarded. They are at the receiving end of the patient uh, who is asking them multiple questions. So at the end of the day, we are looking at evidence based medicine and that is what we are doing and practicing. Thank you. Yeah, I can, I can. If yes, sure, sir. Sure, sir. 
one thing. One statement I think summarizes the whole thing, which was uh, initially made by Ostler and then revived by Boyd. As is your pathology, so is your medicine. I think that statement summarizes the entire dependence of medicine on pathology. Rightly said, sir. Very right. Uh, Vidya, ma'am, can you tell us about the growth of pathology over the years? Um, uh, the growth of pathology has been rapid. Um, it is uh, leaps and bounds. That is what I would say. So um, just a few years back when I was doing my MD pathology, uh, we were having the chikungunya pandemic going on and we were asked as PG students to go and attend uh, uh, to the rural areas. So what used to happen, we had a single uh, microscope and uh, that was the conventional uh, regular unicular microscope that we had and we had to keep it in a window facing the sunlight. So at dusk, there is no sunlight, camp stops. So you can't read your peripheral smears anymore. And you had a technician who used to do the thick and thin smear. The patient used to walk in, they used to do the pin prick. A technician used to do a single minute staining. So no major analyzers, nothing. You only had to screen for the parasites out there if there is and look out for the platelets. That is all we were doing. So the camp used to stop at five o'clock no sunlight, no electricity. So that is how it used to be done uh, during those things. But we have come a long way. Uh, you can see Vadi Ma'am's microscope there. She has a nice binocular microscope with an attached camera and all. That I would say is pathology progressing or uh, even going forward. So now we have uh, earlier, um, uh, during those days, it used to be that the pathologist used to be uh, the single person in the lab doing both microbiology, pathology, biochemistry, everything. But now we need a biochemist, we need microbiologist, we need geneticists. So it has progressed rapidly and we are looking at more advancements where uh, we are looking at more subspecialities as such. So that is how pathology has progressed over the years. This is in terms of our uh, knowledge as well as infrastructure wise where uh, we are now uh, we have uh, uh, we are not doing any more any counting on new birth chambers we're looking at five part six part analyzers we're looking at ai coming into picture so we are looking at digital microscopy we are looking at computational pathology we are in fact trying to do away with a lot of end observer variations we are trying to rely more on machines than the uh, human beings but definitely there is Behind every machine, there has to be a human mind, and that is how pathology is progressing along with instrumentation coming into picture. It has, uh, though it has advanced so much, it has increased also the cost of various testings, which uh, I think is uh, very um, sensitive in a country like India, where many people still can't afford. And uh, in cities like Bangalore and Delhi, Mumbai, everywhere we have these uh, instruments, equipments, trained personnel. But however, uh, whereas when we go to our remotest parts of India, it is still lacking. I think uh, we are having two um, scenarios out here, at least in India, that is what we are observing. So there is lack of training as well as lack of infrastructure when it comes to rural scenario. And this is where maybe uh, I think we need to move and see how best we can help our uh, rural counterparts as well. So uh, it has improved leaps and bounds in terms of knowledge. That is what I would want to say. Uh, maybe for the good and benefit uh, of the uh, healthcare system. Very nicely uh, explained, ma'am. It was like a story, very interesting. Uh, Vani, ma'am. Uh, uh, how do we keep ourselves updated with this growing field, ma'am? Yeah, that is a really a very good question because uh, as a pathologist, uh, it is mandatory that we keep updated. If not, soon we will become redundant. Many a times in front of our uh, fresh pathologists, you know, they'll be knowing so much uh, theoretical knowledge. We feel that we are lagging behind. So we have to keep ourselves updated. And uh, of course, reading regularly, there is no shortcut. We have to read, read, read. Even though you're seniors, you have to read regularly. Now online, everything is available on the social media. If you go to YouTube, several recorded lectures 
in whatever specialties they are available from the experts across the world we can listen to those lectures and we can gain the very good uh, knowledge we can see beautiful slides and we can update you can also subscribe for journal emails see all may not be able to buy the journals so what you know dr santosh especially in my lab he just uh, subscribes for the journal emails you get email from the journal telling that a new edition has been released and you will have the table of contents at least if you read the contents now we will know what are the latest things happening in the particular field like gut journal iapm journal at least we can see the headlines and the titles of the latest uh, publications then we can go to standard websites you know like uh, icsh international uh, council committee for standardization in hematology icsh uh, ch icsh guidelines they have a lot of online courses we can take the online courses like basic coagulation course and we can update ourselves cap guidelines we can log into cap and get all the recent uh, updated uh, cap protocols then if you are reporting lot of pap smears we can log into american uh, society for uh, colposcopy and cervical pathology ascp guidelines for example in 2021 they have updated the uh, cervical cancer screening guidelines so we need to update by going into these websites then when you uh, prepare for talks and slides and in us the speaker themselves will read a lot and update themselves that is another way of updating yourself or if a teacher in a medical college is taking a class for the students he will be updating himself then when we get difficult cases in routine practice we have to read on the same day and we have to have a intra department consultation with our other colleagues and discuss these cases when we get equa slides we can have a discussion within our own lab and we can enhance our knowledge then we should also make a point to attend multidisciplinary meetings cpc clinical pathological uh, meetings is if you are in a hospital setup and they will really uh, broaden your view and you can really update yourself as to what is currently required not something redundant to what you were doing earlier and make it a point to talk to clinical colleagues by talking uh, with our clinical uh, counterparts we will get to know a lot of updates and uh, that will in turn uh, enable us to keep updated so these are some simple tips to keep ourselves updated thank you very valuable points ma'am uh, ma'am do you feel there is a gap between what we want to convey to clinicians through our reports and what clinicians infer from our reports and uh, can good communication bridge this gap it is uh, yes with a capital y it is definitely a big yes communication it is extremely extremely important and there is no way that we can progress without proper communication communication bilateral that is from us to the clinician and the clinician communicating with us both should be very good i maintain a database of all the referral doctors who know who are referring i think i that's a good practice which i would like to tell we can maintain the database pick up the phone call them directly without having to wait for our assistants or secretaries or call centers to call just pick up and call and interact and communicate with the clinician a bilateral communication is very important then we can also um, clinicians when they call us you know we have to be courteous to them and by this communication lot of uh, hazards we can avoid like they will ask us uh, what is the meaning of these uh, words why you are writing this terminology they may not understand the terminology it is our duty to explain to them for example i wrote pilomatricoma immediately he asked yendri adu pilomatricoma nan kelle na hesru na what is it it is our duty to explain it is just a benign adnexal tumor and we can also put in our reports synonym it is a nothing but a benign adnexal uh, tumor of uh, hair follicular origin then we are using a lot of uh, new guidelines you know like old uh, senior gynecologists they are very happy with cgh cystoglandular hyperplasia we don't use the word cgh now it is a outdated term we just write hyperplasia uh, with atypia without atypia so the clinician will say it was a classical cgh we have not mentioned in the report we have to communicate that 
it was an old term and we cannot uh, degrade them you know by telling no no it is outdated we cannot speak like that we can incorporate old terminology was like this new terminology is like this what is the problem we can incorporate the old term like mild moderate severe dysplasia now we are at cin 1 2 if they ask uh, was there a dysplasia we can write synonymous the old terminology this is the current terminology we can always tell and sometimes the clinician will tell your report alli you sariya bardilla malignancy idyo illo gotaglilla it seems some pathologists are being very rude telling if it is not there it is not mentioned we cannot be like that important point please include negative points in the report no malignancy no evidence of cox because the clinician can explain to the patient with our report see there is no malignancy there is no tuberculosis cox like that so important negative points should be communicated to the clinician and we should be ready for reviewing our reports when we interact with the clinician and communicate to them suppose they say somewhat it is not matching with our clinical paraoperatively you know that leomyoma was very adherent it didn't look benign you have given a benign leomyoma can you review it we should not be egoistic we should not think our report is ultimate i have given seen correctly and given we have to say yes we don't mind reviewing our own reports we don't mind taking extra sections suppose they have missed something it is a second chance for us to rectify our mistake so we have to be open if they ask us to review our report when we communicate with the clinicians and uh, also the terminologies also can be explained that i already have told like metaplasia we write so many times metaplasia sometimes clinicians are mistaking it for dysplasia they will say should be follow up you have given metaplasia as seen what to do next we have to explain you know it is it is not having any sinister significance metaplasia is just change in that we have to explain to them that it is not dysplasia they might sometimes the terminologies uh, we need to explain to the clinicians so these are uh, some ways where we can uh, bridge this uh, communication gap between the uh, clinician our report what we write and what they infer one more example in the report i have written no emboli seen the clinician promptly calls up you have not mentioned about lvi that is lymphovascular invasion i said sir no emboli lvi you have not mentioned we have to just what the clinician wants in what terminology they are comfortable i think we should explain to them and communicate with them properly and we should also avoid unnecessary second opinions where there is no communication unnecessarily they will send for second opinion and the patient will be paying the cost it is not truly a case yes there are cases where as uh, jairam sir said neuro neuropath cases it may go for a special second opinion yes that time definitely it is warrant it is warranted but sometimes due to lack of communication it should not go for a second opinion so these are some ways we can bridge uh, the our report by communication that was so crisp uh, with lot of uh, practical points ma'am uh, we had around 120 delegates today lot of appreciations coming in in the chat box Uh, now we are close towards the end of this panel discussion now uh, so finally uh, jairam sir what is your uh, message to our young budding pathologist mm, well a lot of lot of messages have i think passed uh, down uh, the line my very first thing which i would appeal not not even an advice it's an appeal to the younger pathologists you guys have the license to make mistakes now please do not hesitate to voice your opinions voice your impressions because you can make mistakes there is somebody above you who can correct your mistakes but once you climb up the ladder you will find fewer people there you will be alone and that is the time the wisdom you have earned all these years that will come to your rescue and you cannot afford to make mistakes there so having said this uh we recognize that each one of us is a highly intelligent motivated individual who has worked very hard to come to this level of professionalism and 
we realize at this point that we have a lot of responsibilities. We have a responsibility towards our physicians. And that is where I think keeping abreast with the latest requirements, latest terminologies, developments, and then incorporating these, the knowledge which you're gaining by, as Dr. Vani mentioned, how you keep abreast with the developments, the knowledge you gain, you incorporate into your reports. The advice you would give based on this knowledge would convert into effective patient care, which the physician can deliver. So that is one aspect we have to always bear in mind. And the second thing is your responsibility to your patients. Please, all of us, we go gaga over slides, beautiful histopathology, highly malignant tumor, very rare tumor and all. We just forget that there is a human being behind that sample of blood or behind that slide. We need to understand no matter how much we kind of pat our back saying that we made a rare diagnosis, how what you're going to communicate is going to convert into something of value to that patient is what we need to introspect. And we need to work towards that. And the third, Dr. Mahesh very nicely uh, you know, elaborated our responsibilities to the society. I will not talk too much about that. And last but not the least, our own responsibilities to our families. Please do not neglect your families. Please devote equal attention to ensure that, after all, what we are doing is not for anything else because ultimately we need to come back to our families and what we strive and struggle is only to build a good family. So please focus on your family, strengthen your family ties and have a wonderful life outside your profession also. That way, I think once you have a wonderful life outside your profession, automatically your passion for your profession also is going to increase. So these are a few words which I thought I'll share with you. Thank you, sir, for that uh, beautiful message. Uh, Vani ma'am, your message to the budding pathologist here. Actually, when I saw that question, you know, I wanted to say pass because the budding pathologists, they are very smart, they are very active. They are much better than us, so I thought I should say pass. But then I thought I will just, uh, uh, I was interacting with my colleagues in the lab and they said, no, no, ma'am, you have to share at least one or two points. The first point I would like to share is choose any one subspeciality within your own lab and you try to gain maximum knowledge within that particular uh, area of interest. Suppose you're reporting hematology. Go into deep into something like either your CBC, the machines, the histograms. So go deep into that and become a master in that. Suppose you're reporting cytology. Go deep into that, become a master in reporting your cervical cytology or FMAC or histo. Nobody is stopping you to become an expert. Read maximum about it and become get a maximum uh, knowledge about a particular subspeciality. Please choose that. All of us may not be able to do a DM course. At least we can... Uh, gain this knowledge uh, out of our own interest. The second uh, message is, please do not compare ourselves as pathologists. We should not compare ourselves with other engineers or other professions or other clinical colleagues. No comparison. They are very unique. We should not compare, oh, they are, they are like that, they are like this, this uh, uh, surgeons uh, uh, need so much money. We are all, no comparison. We are unique. We are special. We are the backbone for the uh, clinicians and we should be very proud of it and no comparison and please develop very good rapport with your clinicians very important we have to respect the clinicians we should not uh, uh, talk uh, ill or something loose you know they have not provided any history they have not written proper uh, trfs like that we have to respect we have to develop good rapport with them we have to communicate with them because you know we are helping them for the patient management so please develop good rapport with the clinicians and uh, have their database of their phone numbers and talk to them communicate the reports and uh, uh, give fast tat so that they're very happy so this is my message to the budding pathologists thank you 
Ma'am, I'm glad that you did not pass because uh, we got to learn some points. Otherwise, we would have missed out on that. Each of us is unique, special. Just love that point, Ma'am. Mahisa, your message to our uh, budding pathologist. Uh, sir, I think uh, you have muted yourself, sir. We are unable to hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Ah, okay. Right. Many of my points covered by Jairam sir and Wadi, madam. I would like to put only three uh, important points. One thing is that budding pathologist should uh, should have a very strong basics about the like it be histology or a lab testing processes, everything. They should not forget about that basics because many of these new advanced technology are based on these smaller basic concepts itself. So you, you should you should be able to identify where exactly is going wrong. And the second point is, uh, you should also learn yourself that when this case requires a second opinion, right? Uh, this this part of curriculum is there in uh, UK based uh, pathology practices. They teach the resident that when to when to analyze this specimen or uh, this uh, sample or a uh, histopathology requires a second opinion that they learn it but they should they should not hesitate that why should i take a second opinion that they, they should be a free mind that okay this has got some differential diagnosis or some doubt let me take a second opinion okay we are many of the pathologists or their senior colleagues or their staff they're ready to help them out they should not hesitate this is this is the way they get the confidence in future right and the third point uh, regarding the accreditation process, I think budding pathologists should be involved in every aspect of accreditation, right? Uh, I would like to advise everyone, the budding pathologist should undergo that uh, quality management uh, uh, system training programs. Once they pass out or they come out from this course, they start analyzing that how much uh, quality conscious should be there in a lab, right? With these points, I think uh, very clear that budding pathologists will grow flourishly. That is a very nice one, sir. Knowing when to go for a second opinion and not hesitating in asking for a second opinion. Very well brought out, sir. Uh, Vidya, ma'am, your message for our budding pathologist. Uh, I have few points for the budding pathologist. Uh, one is uh, passion. So you need to be passionate about the subject, the work that you're doing. So go in. It is not just all about sitting behind the microscope and seeing your slide. Go talk to the technician, see what they are doing, be a manager as well. So that is very, very important. You need to know what is happening on the uh, bench tops. So unless you have the bench top knowledge, you will not know what has come and landed on your table or on your screen on your computer. So this is very important uh, for each and every budding pathologist to know the nuances of the lab, how the lab functions, how the sample enters the lab, what are you supposed to do at each level. That is very important even before you start seeing your slides or analyzing your your samples so i see that most of them miss this and uh, immediately they come to the lab start seeing their slides and they don't go in and see what has already happened during the night or in the morning hours so because most of the labs run their qcs in the morning you need to be aware of how the qcs are run whether the instrument is functioning properly or not for you to deliver that result out so unless you're going to go see what is the troubleshoot you need to do this aspect somehow is missing uh, these days so everyone is trying to take it easy and see that okay now the sample has come i'm going to do the report and go no, that is not how it is going to happen so you need to show that passion in every aspect of your lab working that is what uh, needs to be done and that is the right way of progressing uh, that is from basics to your high-end mm -hmm. uh, tests that you're going to do in your lab because at the end of the day we are looking at the patient uh, finally each sample belongs to a patient and you are directing the diagnosis and treatment for that particular patient so you cannot be negligent and this you need to imbibe in all your colleagues who are working in the lab including your technologists or your even your non-technical staff who are handling the samples so this goes up to the level of even your biomedical waste management that is also equally important the second thing i would want to say is descriptions so these days, especially, uh, be it your peripheral smear descriptions or your histopath descriptions, right practice. When you're starting out your uh, practice, you need to see every slide even before everyone can make a diagnosis. Everyone knows that there is a tumor, but how are you going to describe? 
what is the tumor microenvironment all these are essential aspects that are coming into picture now and these will take you a long way when you start practicing writing down each and every point you would not have still reached that level where you need to uh, release a single sentence report and uh, during the uh, earlier part of the panel discussion also we have heard that we need those elaborate descriptions now with even more uh, elaborate uh, impressions along with comment boxes everything so this is what you need to practice in your young days otherwise it will never happen so you'll only say even even for a simple case as an appendix take out the slide practice the description that is what you need to do so that you know what is there on your slide is all there on your report because like Vani Ma'am said uh, many people go for opinions so it shouldn't be that some other pathologist is going to pick up what you have missed so that should not be it should in fact be okay now there's a good description so that is how your report should appear at the end of the day the other thing i would want to say is try to practice the right thing wherever you are and in whatever you do because there is a lot of uh, cost consciousness which is happening in the market along with even uh, delivering quality results at the same time so you need to balance the two and it is a hard thing to do, which you need to uh, imbibe and see that wherever you are, you are practicing the right thing. Definitely cases, your own cases have to be reviewed and you should not be afraid to review your own cases. You may need to amend your reports. That is one other thing where you should not be afraid of doing it. You need to communicate to the clinician and say that, okay, now this is something wrong that we have done. We are correcting it. And here is your right report. So you should never be afraid of that. And wherever you are, practice the right aspects of both quality and be cost conscious as well. So cost consciousness also comes into picture because we are not allowed to be that spendthrifty in the lab scenario. So this is what youngsters need to know and learn in the lab. That is equally important. These are few points that I would want to say. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am, for bringing in that point about being passionate. So passionate pathologists and not only sit with the microscope, but go around to know the technical aspects and be in a position to troubleshoot and descriptions like uh, rightly ma'am said, we all have to learn to describe uh, our slides and uh, specimens very nicely. Uh, Umashankar sir, your message to the budding pathologists here. Yeah. Arjuna, do you want only one message or a couple of messages? Couple of messages, sir, because, because it most, will really uh, help all of us. Yes, most of the points have been already been covered by Jaram, sir, Vani, madam, and uh, all other panelists. But I think I have jotted down some other points here. I need to uh, uh, take one by one. Uh, always remember that you are a part of the patient management system. What I see sometimes is uh, young budding pathologists are scared to speak to their clinical colleagues. So when I ask them to speak, get some information on the clinical uh, patient uh, history. They usually talk to their uh, residents, not to the clinician. So don't uh, get scared or don't feel incredibly complex to speak to a clinical police. And they, they are all, always a part of your patient management system. So directly take a phone and uh, speak to your clinical colleagues. And what happens in this digital, digital era is we are exposed to a lot of information. Don't just be informed, acquire knowledge also. Because uh, earlier days when we were uh, uh, Reading, they are, they are limited textbooks are there. They are some knows about that. But nowadays, all digital books, there are so many books are there, and uh, the resident doesn't know uh, which book to read. They keep on reading it, but when it comes to practice, they do not know how to practice or how to apply their uh, information with those being gathered. So, get information, but uh, up, uh, put it into practice. The application knowledge is very important. And develop skills, learn some soft skills, and be a lifelong learner. Doesn't mean that you should be uh, practicing only pathology. There are so many other aspects of pathology also, which is required to you know your uh, passion. So you need to be uh, learn those skills also. And of course, pathology is not is not an easy subject. You need to take risk. So take some risk, calculate risk, but to don't be overconfident. So you need to take risk here, and uh, you should be very cautious when you take this. And especially what uh, my sister has told, uh, documentation is very very important. So actually. Uh, you have to maintain your documents very uh, properly and uh, you know data management is an actual skill archana you've been knowing that i many times i take a class for an excel how to uh, yes, excel yes, sheet and uh, how to yes, extract sir. the data from excel sheet and uh, that's a that's how skill i've learned it and moment you're uh, you know excel in those uh, data management system i think uh, you'll be excelling those areas again uh, same communication is skill and not only communication you should know when to communicate and what to communicate 
and uh, try to avoid this uh, social media you know just send a whatsapp message and uh, your clinical colleague will see the message and uh, next day onwards no and when you you should be very very clear in your in, your, in communication and you should know how to communicate and what to communicate and if you don't want to communicate you should avoid communication also that is again a skill it is and uh, things should be simple make it simple and keep it simple uh, and as we know pathology has got lot of uh, gray zones but you know the gray zones but you should be very very clear enough where to put it right which the right or right wrong is wrong and don't be ambiguous you know today you say something tomorrow morning get up and say uh, something else so you should be knowing what is right what is wrong and what where is it, what what is gray zone but don't be ambiguous and lastly what i mean to say is if you are not able to make a diagnosis write it even a no diagnosis is a diagnosis but when you say when you can't make a diagnosis take up uh, take a phone uh, call your uh, clinical uh, clinical colleague and tell them what difficulty you are facing why you are not able to give proper diagnosis in this case probably that solves the issue because uh, the case may be require a repeat biopsy or some other basic information present scenario it is not possible to give a diagnosis explain to him so don't uh, be always that any metal which is which are given to you should be having diagnosis even if you are not able to make a diagnosis it's also right but always make it a point that you should speak to your clinical colleague i think that's all i wanted to tell, tell to my endocrinologist uh, thank you sir uh, we have lot of appreciations in the chat box so uh, in fact uh, uh, one or two of the delegates have uh, uh, say, sent this message i request the organizers to encapsulate the contents of this wonderful session into a write up that can serve as a valuable guide for uh, post graduates so lot of comments very good comments in the chat box i thank all the panelists uh, for having accepted uh, uh, and uh, for being a part of this uh, discussion despite your uh, busy schedule uh, over to dr aditya uh, thank you uh, dr ashna ma'am and all the panelists for the extremely well conducted panel discussion and i'm sure the impact of this panel discussion is evident from the uh, comments that we are receiving on the uh, youtube chat box and i'm sure i hope the message percolates down to the all the post graduates all the pathologists working even in the private center and a small setup so that they can incorporate all of the uh, learnings from this panel discussion into their day to day practice and so that we can deliver a better care to the patients and uh, prove resourceful to all the clinicians as well i thank all the panelists for joining us today and we promise to conduct more such panel discussions uh, which will be beneficial to all our delegates and this video will be available forever on youtube so i advise uh, all the past post graduates to share the link of this video so that more of the post graduates can watch it and uh, learn from this webinar uh, thank you jairam sir thank you vani ma'am thank you vidya ma'am thank you umashankar sir and mai sir for such uh, sharing your experience and achana ma'am for thank you for conducting such webinars so well thanks a lot thank you dr thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. good night thank you good night, good night. thanks signing out from kcrpm we'll be back with more